got that recording thing going, then we can start. Okay, so again, this is the uh, series that we're calling the Trader's Playbook because what we want to do really here is come up with a few different ways for you to really understand the whole idea of what trigger charts is all about and how you can actually make some money from it. Because a lot of times what we have found is that while there is a pretty easy, basic uh, view of the markets through the market profiles that we put together and the overall way that it's presented, sometimes when you first look at it, for example, it could be a little overwhelming. But more so, there's a lot of little details that you really want to pay attention to and what you want to see when you're actually looking at these charts because there's a lot of things that we've talked about before, for example, using different time frames, understanding a, an, a, a large and wide range of consolidation from a smaller range of consolidation or when the breakouts occur and also when do you look at things like okay where do I take the uh, my, my, my profit here or where do I say okay you know what that's enough I'm out so let's take a look at this let me make sure this is all looking right here okay good so in this session, basically what we're going to talk about here is this. We're going to talk about the um, a thing that we've, we've uh, initiated because a lot of people have asked us for this. And sometimes that's how it really happens is that you have a product and the people are saying, you know what, I'd really like to get a much better knowledge of it. So even though we do these webinars and these discussions, what I want to do is introduce you that we are going to have an educational division, if you will, that's going to be doing group and private coaching. And, of course, introducing you to Corey Rosenblum and a product overview for those of you that maybe haven't seen it before. We're going to be talking about auction market theory today. And auction market theory is the basis of what we're going to be really presenting on a chart because we want to understand, okay, where are the buyers setting up? Where are the sellers setting up? Where is the place where I can initiate a trade? Where is a place where I should either get out of a trade or maybe even add on to a trade? And that goes to the whole idea of crowd psychology and, and the crowd movement in terms of, okay, what's happening? And that's momentum. Are they moving in? Are they moving out? Um, and talking about how the markets do, in fact, change, although lately it's been all about just let's move it up and hope for the best. And regardless of economics regardless of the fundamentals and that does sometimes occur and that's what the current market environment is now I'll share with you and I want to make sure I'm very clear about this it will not always be that way one day fundamentals will matter one day economics will matter one day well maybe not one day maybe sometime in the future God knows when the Fed will be out of the market uh, process because really what you're trading against right now is the Fed we talk about supply and demand, and that's the basic tenant of the markets in terms of when people are looking to buy something, how many people are buying it, what is the volume and the amount of um, excitement they have with it. And basically the thing that we always talk about is the two phases of the market. You have one phase, which is a consolidation, which is kind of just it's cruising along, doing its thing, and one is where we want to actually enter trades which is breakouts or fast zones. And I think the last thing that we really want to focus in today is thinking outside of the traditional theory of what is an indicator and what do they do? You know, are they just going to show us, okay, the trend is moving in a different direction and hop on? Or are they going to give us a range of where we can play? Or better yet, many people say, you know what, it shows that it has these things lining up but how can I really tell what to do here? And that's what these have all been designed to do, is to help you understand you know, what to do in, in the different um, uh, situations. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about Corey Rosenblum for a moment. He's a, an expert in the area of technical analysis. And technical analysis essentially is the study of charts, okay? And what you do with those is that you really don't pay attention to things like maybe economic numbers, maybe uh, some fundamentals, but you're really looking at the price action, and the assumption here is that the crowd psychology is really what is, in fact, the most important part of all this. The crowd and what the masses are doing in terms of their movement maybe knows things that we don't, and therefore they take that into consideration, 
and move a stock in a particular direction. He's a chartered market technician, which means that he has a good deal of knowledge and education in the area of technical analysis, a pretty uh, intense course load to get that designation, and uh, he does have that. And basically, this particular um, uh, this designation is a very um, focused but yet diverse uh, process where there is the use of all these technical indicators. But if you go back and look at Corey's history, I mean, he started out working with um, his dad and doing a lot of fundamental work and then sort of moved into this whole area of uh, technical analysis and really became a, 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 just an expert in that area. Um, and, you know, when you look at the, the idea of what is involved in this, we're really talking about, uh, as we always want to look for, is, is patterns, trends, and uh, a, a broad range of, of different indicators that may, in fact, confirm each other. Uh, he has a bachelor's in psychology, a master's in public affairs, and the, the psychology ma uh, uh, is really the important thing here because we're really talking about the markets, we're talking about psych psychology or psych psychosis, <laughs> depending on how you look at it, I guess. Uh, but, you know, Corey has been, uh, he started out uh, years ago, and I know him for many, many years, in Alabama, uh, kind of a, uh, uh, call him the redneck technician, although not really. He's a great guy, and he actually moved to L.A. recently and uh, has, has been expanding his operation for some time. He runs the uh, Freight Trade blog, um, and he uh, is a pro prolific writer and also does uh, a variety of videos, asked to speak just extensively throughout the country. So um, he's also the author of a uh, book called uh, The Complete Trading Course and um, is, is also the, a blog uh, writer of Afraid to Trade. So um, let, me, um, <clears throat> let me bring him up here, and um, we're going to kind of switch over here. Let me uh, bring up Corey. Okay, Corey, you are – you there, Corey? Hello, Corey. I'm here, Andrew. Can you hear oh, me? You can see great. the screen. Yeah, great. I can hear you. You sound yeah, hello, Andrew. Can you, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Okay, so Corey, you know, I'm going to ask Corey to take it away. Again, this is being recorded, so um, I think that uh, you'll really enjoy this, and I really uh, would ask you a favor uh, to pay attention because the things that you're going to learn here, I think, are really just superior. There's a, the way that he's going to teach this, because we've went over this many times, is just excellent. Take it away, buddy. Thank you, Andrew, and hope I can live up to the hype of the introduction there. Very much appreciated for that. And Andrew and I did meet actually in 2008 and have been working together either as friends or colleagues or now working together on this. So that's I've really enjoyed our friendship and collegial relationship. So again, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for all attending. And this is a it's a topic market profile, market uh, auction theory. These things are concepts, but they matter because it gets to the core of what moves prices. It's not indicators. It's not sentiment, necessarily. It's not internals. It's this supply-demand differential. A lot of emotions go into trading. And if you've ever traded for any length of time and spent with any sort of indicator, and that's one thing I did with the CMT, the Market Technicians Program, we had to learn so many indicators and so many strategies and so many methods. And through my professional career, what really makes money, to be honest, is simplicity. It's not complexity in the market. It's really getting a sense of supply demand, getting a sense of key levels on the market, levels that if breached, if traded into, should make a market movement. And that's what Andrew has put together with these tools in the trigger chart series. And that's why I'm pleased to be speaking on behalf of that and, and really working with, together with Andrew and learning more about these and how to put these tools to use for just simple, simple tactics that matter, tactics that make sense. And what we'll look at for the presentation, again, is focusing on psychology, supply, demand, crowd, key levels, fast zones, which are trending or impulse environments. I like to play those particularly with breakout trades or retracements. We'll discuss those. And the alternate range, which are literally trading ranges. So we'll differentiate what sets up value, what sets up ranges, why indicators, and I cover this to an extent in the trading course, why indicators work in some environments but completely fail in others. For example, moving averages work very well in, rain, in trend environments when the market's trading up and pulling back. They completely fail, meaning price will chop through them in a range environment. 
And the same is true for general oscillators, stochastic, RSI, MACD, so on and so forth. They will work very well in range environments, but will fail in trending environments. So what we'll do is, I think the foundation of trading needs to be a focus on supply demand and shifting environments. So what we'll look at to start the presentation today is a concept of market profile, lots of lots of words like that, price auction theory, but it really comes down to supply demand. That's what we'll focus on. So just generally thinking or conceptualizing the last time you attended an, au an auction or saw one on TV, we have an item presented, emotions are high, there's a crowd, there's bidding, there's price movement, price action, enthusiasm, and finally it reaches its final with the price or the auction item being sold. And the auction is over. And at that point, we move to a new auction. Well, think of this as we go through this part of the presentation. Try to relate the concepts we're discussing with price and trades and trading strategies and why indicators don't move markets, but why price crowd, psychology, emotions do, and how we can typically step outside of those emotions. In a general auction, what we look for is just say an item is presented. Say, in this case, the picture shows a vase, or a piece of art, or a car, whatever the auction is for. And the auction bidder starts at, a, say, usually typically a low level. And as the price is low, people are excited. Ah, give me that. I've got, I have to have that. I need that vase. I need that piece of art. I need this. And so the price rises as the bids increase. But what happens as the price increases, and these little um, people, they look like larvae, but they're people, uh, conceptually at least, they're the green are bidders. So in theory, as price is low, activity is high. Think of this in the market as volume. So activity, enthusiasm, psychology, emotions, we bid. But as the price actually rises, particularly in auction, they have to pull the price higher to shut off the buyers, the bidders. So activity is moderate, prices we would say fair at value. We'll see how these terms play in the future. But as price reaches its absolute high, activity is low, and in fact, when will the auction end? When will the bidder slam the gavel down and say, sold, We're going once, going twice, sold? That's when the next to last bidder steps out. That's when he or she quits the auction and says, that's too high. There's a game when the price is right. If you play that or watch the TV, it says, that's too high. Well, that's the same thing. So buyers will bid, price will increase, and in fact, price is required to increase. We'll see how that plays in the market for forecasting until the last bidder says no more. And what happens when the auction ends is one little person, one happy bidder jumps up and says, as we saw on the other slide, I won. I've got this item. I'm so excited. Well, think of it in terms of value in the market. Let's, oh, by the way, think of it this way. Did this person overpay or underpay for the item? And what caused the last bidder to step out? So let's assume temporarily that an item we know for a fact is worth $5,000, a vase or piece of art or something like that. So if the auction starts at $2,000, people bid it up. At $5,000, that's fair. You can take this and go on eBay or to your local pawnbroker and, and sell an item for $5,000. So there's no point really in bidding above that. You'll, it's inefficient. But say the price goes to seven, eight, nine thousand, and we know this is not worth that. But people are still bidding. Why might that be? It could be that a husband and wife are paired, and honey, I have to have this vase. I have to have this. It's just an emotional decision, not a financial decision. So this husband will keep bidding until his availability to buy is it runs out, or he just winds up saying, honey, you know, I love you all, but I, I can't afford this vase. But anyway, an auction will end when the last bidder is fulfilled. So we'll see how this plays out in the market. And of course, that person overpaid. In the stock market, we'll see, just for references, if the main idea is as we look at the price charts next, low prices encourage bidding. Low prices typically encourage activity. Higher prices discourage bidding. It gets expensive, too high. And so these things are forecasting variables if we put them in market terms. So price must 
is required. That's a forecasting principle to move higher, to shut off the bidders, to stop them, to drop them out of the market. In other words, price will rise until buyers stop bidding. We'll see how Apple traded to $700 a share and then really collapsed after that. Silver traded to $50 per ounce and collapsed after that. Gold to, I think, $1,900 and collapsed. But there were bidders up until that point. When the bidding stopped, the music stopped. And of course, price can move lower to encourage buyers or encourage bidders. On a chart, this is just a typical bar chart with volume. And what we'll talk about also, Andrew mentioned it earlier, but we'll see in much more detail, are these value areas, these compression points, these sideways movements versus these trending or impulsive market movements. And these are two different things to watch. So as an upward auction in 2012 started on a breakout above about 450, 440, the up auction was violent, quick, fast, impulsive, lots of volume, lots of participation, lots of excitement, but eventually it stopped. The last buyer, the last fund, the last person said, okay, well, 650, I sold. I'm so happy to have bought Apple this high. Well, that was it. It was over. And you can see at least for that particular point in time. And we can look at volume as a confirming indicator that as price went up, volume also went up until the final high. Think of the same kind of issue with an auction. When the price goes up, people drop out. Ah, that's too expensive. I don't really want that vase. I don't really want that car. I don't want that piece of art. And it's the same thing here. But there are people that will bid those high prices. This would be inefficiency, emotion, jumping on a crowd or jumping into a crowd uh, that really pushes you off a cliff, say like a lending or something. But if you have to have this high price, you can get it. And the market will rise in price until people stop bidding or stop buying. Then it typically will form a value area. We'll see how this works. And then eventually another up auction occurs. Same thing with volume. And finally, 700 per share, so just really anemic volume or low volume. And that was the end of the auction. And until this point, late 2013, Apple has not traded to this level. Uh, so we saw sell volume increase. We'll talk about sell volume and short sells and how a down auction works later in future presentations, but right now we're just discussing from the angle of up markets, up auctions. So if we think of conceptualizing this, bringing auction theory to price, to charts, to trading, fundamentals, technical, psychology, sentiment, whatever we use to measure our variables to trade the market, price will advertise an opportunity. When I was learning market profile or price auction theory, well, what is this opportunity word? What does that mean? It's just simply a chance to buy shares. And so price says, is this high? Do you, the market participants, with all your emotions and fears and greed and, and, and thoughts and valuations and charts, so on and so forth, do you perceive this price as too high? Do you perceive it as too low? Or is it fair? And markets will move accordingly to what the crowd or the participants view as price. Unfortunately, I wish it were this case, but there's not a yes, there's not exactly a fixed value. Apple is worth four hundred dollars. Gold is worth five fifteen hundred. It, it doesn't exist. So price, as we'll see throughout the presentation and the future presentations, price is on a never ending quest for value. So time regulates opportunity. This has to do with sideways trading ranges, sideways movement, this horizontal notion. Ranges, if you look at charts, it will be patterns as such as triangles, rectangles, wedges, uh, so on and so forth. So how long does tr price trade at a given price level? Now, not so much an exact penny figure, but up and down in a 10-point range or 5% range, that's your value area. How long does it trade there? Longer time at a level means more acceptance, more fair value. Lower time at a level, this plays directly into these trigger chart radar, blue zones and red zones, and Andrew will talk about that shortly, but this is conceptualizing how that sets up. Time at a level matters. It affects our trading decisions, or at least it should. And then volume reveals participation, which is enthusiasm. 
again, higher prices at higher volume means acceptance. This means price should keep going higher. That is a forecasting variable for the future that has to do with breakout trades and retracements. Higher price at lower volume, lower participation, enthusiasm, is another forecasting variable that says this option, this movement probably will fail or will stop because there are fewer buyers at higher and higher levels. Even though crowd psychology might represent or reflect extremes. In other words, I'm very, very bullish at the high. Apple at 700, the S&P shy of 1800, gold at 1900. I'm extraordinarily bullish. I have all the shares that I want. And that's it. There's nobody left to buy, in some sense, literally. And the market has nothing else to do. It can do nothing else but go down. So volume is a confirmation, non-confirmation tool. Also think of money on the street. You've heard this example before. If there's a penny, a fixed dollar value, lying on the street, who's going to stoop down and pick the penny up? It's just probably not worth your time. Uh, a dime, would you pick up a dime? Maybe, maybe not. A quarter here in Los Angeles, quarters, particularly Santa Monica, are worth something because that pays for street parking. So quarters are more valuable in a sense uh, than pennies and dimes, of course. But a dollar bill, how long will that last in the street? How long will a $5 bill last just in the open public? $10, so on and so forth. And so these things are opportunities when the price in a market says Apple at 500. Is that cheap or expensive? Is that more applicable to be a penny? and eh, not worth my time, just let it go, I'm not going to take this trade, or is this, my gosh, it's like a $100 bill on the ground. I've got to get an Apple right here, right now, or Google, or eBay, whatever the stock is, gold, silver. So that's what we're looking at, this same kind of concept, that a very valuable, very obvious opportunity in the market will not last long. So we need core strategies, core skills, core confidences, and knowledge of market movement and ways to find trades to take those opportunities when they exist, because they won't. Apple, we'll see this shortly, but Apple, when it was breaking higher, did not last long at higher and higher levels. Price had to continuously rise to shut off buyers. In other words, a breakout, and we'll see this future in the future uh, presentations too in more detail, but a higher price is just like a $100 bill lying on the ground. Will not last there long. Apple at a very high level might not be as attractive, and especially in terms of professional views who have fundamental valuations and use these sort of volume metrics and tools. As Andrew mentioned, as I mentioned as, as well, price is on a never-ending quest for value, and just value is simply defined as a fair price that buyers and sellers agree on. $100 is more valuable than 50, than a penny. Uh, that's clear, but in the market, it's not as clear, especially when looking at fundamentals, uh, earnings, technical analysis, which does factor into price movement, by the way, sentiment, all those factors that cause buyers to enter or sellers to sell or to exit the market, these things are playing into what we perceive as value. And of course, logically, but it is worth stating, that buyers and sellers work against each other. They're not, uh, they're more so foes than friends. So buyers, of course, in general, this is theoretics, but they view price as undervalued now. It's a perception. Maybe they see a chart pattern, a fundamental earnings, Tesla, or whatever the stock is, is undervalued now. That's their perception, they, thus they act. They wish to sell the shares they purchased, their opportunity they took, later at a profit. Buyers may be emotional. Remember the husband-wife example? Oh, honey, I must have this vase. I must have it. Well, it's overbought, overvalued. doesn't matter. I want the vase. All right. You have to get into Apple here. So be it. You overpaid. Maybe it worked. Maybe it didn't in terms of an uh, emotional trade with the indicators and the strategies and we typically try not to do this, and I say typically because we're all human, but uh, strategies, indicators, methods, particularly methods, and Andrew talks about these shortly, but that's what we're trying to eliminate. As best as we can are these emotional, inefficient, improper, inappropriate 
at least in a value sense, decisions. Uh, they may buy over value. Typically not a good idea. Sellers similarly view prices overvalued at this exact point, and maybe the exact point in time, and they'll take profits or they'll put on a short sell position. They may be emotional. How many times have we all had this happen? You put a trade on, the value goes down 5%, 10%, 15%, and eventually we sell not because of technical analysis or fundamental valuation or whatever the case is, based on a strategy or method or really just intelligent decisions, we make it based on emotion, pain, and that's not a good thing. So one thing that helps, especially with these value areas and these trigger chart indicators that can show you where you should sell, doesn't mean you have to sell, but ideally, if a certain level breaks, let's go ahead and kill the position, exit, bail, not hold that position, hoping and praying that it comes back. That's really inefficient trading and very expensive trading for that matter. So stop losses also trigger selling, both in a good sense of, oh, it was just a random trade that failed, no problem, no emotion, or just I can't take the pain. So that's just, again, emotion versus strategy, discretion versus system, facts versus really just pain and feeling. So this is how we try to eliminate those as much as possible in our trading, but also take advantage of inefficiencies or one side of the market being squeezed. One thing I like to trade, and Andrew probably would agree, are these pain points or short squeezes. I call them pop stops, particularly when a market breaks a resistance level that it should not break and just impulses violently higher. As a buyer, that's a good thing because a short sell, short side of the market are being squeezed. They're capitulating, they're exiting, which propels price higher. And of course, if we're in the bullish trade, money into our trading account. That's really the goal of trading anyway. Now, just this value area concept, same kind of issue, won't spend too much time on this, we go into more detail, but there's always a midpoint value area. There's always an undervalued or oversold, whatever you wish to call it, level, support line, and overvalued or expensive so on and so that's how traders make decisions as to put trades on to limit risk to place stop losses and we do that also with indicators too but one thing to watch shown to this thematically throughout the presentation is that trend lines are subjective it's imprecise does a trend line go at 420 what about 350 and to be honest i have problems with this too when doing analysis um, i like to tr connect as many points as possible but even still that's subjective, so uh, Andrew might draw them differently. These indicators show how this can be done or how, can, how this can be eliminated and cut some of the guesswork and subjectiveness out of value areas. That's what the indicators are designed to do. So this is a general thinking on ranges. But the same kind of issue, this is Apple back in 2012, we see a clear value area, 390 thereabout, 410 and 360, these were overbought. That was an emotional or a spike high, uh, unfair high, person overpaid for that, and the auction traded lower. The same thing happened in early in January 2012. Then Apple gaps to 450. Ah, what do we do? Is this overvalued? Is it undervalued? Well, that's what the market participants are having to deal with individually. So what we're looking to do is have a more precise level for initiations of trades stops. If you're short, of course, having a stop above these trend lines, that's what we're looking to do. But once again, this is confusing. This is impulsive. This is emotional in some senses. What do I do? Do I put a trade on? Do I wait? So on and so forth. This is what we call inefficiency or breakout. This is the core of strategies, but we don't know as market participants whether this will just be a failure or a breakout. So uh, the strategies that Andrew talks about really delves in more detail for that. We can look at volume, but the indicators incorporate that for us. As we saw, if you remember what happened next in Apple, this was our, let's go back in time, oh, this is overbought, really, really overbought, really, really inefficient, way higher than it should be. So next slide is what happened next, this up auction. At this point, the supply demand issue or balance changed the market went from balanced 
or sideways horizontal slow range dynamics to this violent, fast, open air. I like to use the word open air pocket. There's just nothing else there. It's a price option higher. And remember the forecasting predictive value. A market trending up with higher volume, higher enthusiasm, tends more than not to trade even higher. Why? The market has to pull the price higher to shut off those buyers. When buyers overcome sellers, price must rise, just in the same way that that auctioneer, give me 450, give me 470, 475, do I hear five? I do, okay, nice, 525, do I hear five? Okay, 550, 556, so on and so forth. Eventually, the volume, the participation will decrease, and the up auction will end. But there were plenty of opportunities to add to positions, buy on breakouts, and there were additional breakouts, and additional smaller value areas that occurred, uh, retracements, flag patterns, as this up auction continued. And it continued indefinitely with higher and higher volume, at least until it ended, until the last buyer in that audience. Remember, trading is a fixed arena. There are a fixed number of people. It's not infinite. There's a fixed amount of dollars. So when a price gets too high, same thing as price is right, that's too high, it has to come down. There's just no one left to bid the thing higher. So in a collective sense. So Apple traded lower and established its second value area. So that's what we're looking at. Value, quest for value, impulse. We'll define these things shortly and in much more detail. So as Andrew hinted, these two types of market phases tend to be sideways, which is the most of the trading time. That makes sense. That's efficient behavior. We know the range fair value, and of course a market exists to facilitate trade. So just think of theoretically what a market exists for to facilitate traders, buyers, sellers, bring them together and transact. That's why the market tends more than not to spend more time within these fair value ranges. This will lead us to play fade trades, as we'll see in the next couple of slides, but these are sideways trading ranges. In terms of definition, if you'll write these down and reference these, we'll use them frequently, that what we'll see is buyers and sellers agree. Price action is efficient. Price movement is slow. In other words, you can take your time. You don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, I missed the trade, I'm out, I'm, that's the end of my trading career, da, da, da. all these emotions don't exist to the same extent that they do in breakout or impulsive environments. We also see clear boundaries, support resistance, and that's just simply drawing trend lines. Again, subjective. So the thematics or takeaways from this sideways range phase would be simply sideways, slow, horizontal. The exact opposite of that, which is inefficient or breakouts or these trends. We as traders like to trade trends what we don't realize a lot of times is that trends are actually inefficient. It is throwing traders off their base, and it's really difficult to find what's cheap, expensive, and in fact, those words don't actually exist. Uh, again, Apple at 400 was cheap when it was trading in a range, but at 450 actually is, in terms of the trend in the future, cheap relative to a future value area. So that's we'll see that happen in other examples too. But these we like to refer for as fast zones, impulsive, trending patterns, flags, breakouts, all those fun little patterns on the chart or just uh, impulsive environments. We also call these positive feedback loops where higher prices begat higher prices as more bulls get excited, more buyers step in, add to positions perhaps, but also short sellers who are on the other side of trades think the market's overvalued, they actually have to stop out. Their stop losses help to propel a market even higher. So that's another factor in the supply-demand relationship too, the other side being stopped out. So it's just the exact opposite. Price is inefficient. There's disagreement. There's heightened emotions, confusion. Oh, if I buy now, this is a top that's going to reverse. Oh, so I'm going to stay out, and then, of course, the market goes even higher, making you even more frustrated as a trader. That's no fun. 
price movement is fast, quick, rapid, impulsive, violent, volatile. And price shows no boundaries. It's a breakout. So the words we'll use to classify this is vertical fast trend. And again, going back to our initial concept, price will, in fact, price must, just by definition, auction higher, must move higher as long as there are buyers wishing to buy, purchase shares. It's a fact of trading. So price goes up to shut them off. Once they're in a position, they're no longer buyers. They are holders. They are not adding positions typically. So that's what price must go higher to shut off the buyers. And it will go higher until the last fund, the last trader, the last group of traders are finished. And the sellers overtake buyers in the relationship. And that tends to devolve into a trading range. Now this is the radar altimeter and auto, autopilot with eBay. I know I showed, showed the uh, example of Apple uh, multiple times. And then triggercharts.com, and Andrew will talk, talk about it shortly, but, and this is not my, my uh, indicators, it's Andrew's of course, but I'm just doing the conceptual framework for this presentation. Andrew goes into much more detail about what these colors mean and how this uh, affects trading decisions. This is what we'll talk about in the coaching sessions, the group sessions too. But in general, this is our two phases of movement. Horizontal, slow range, April through October, really 2011. There was an initial breakout, $32 per share, and above the prior high, $35 per share, as eBay auctioned higher and formed little value areas, but it traded all the way up to $55.60, at which point a secondary value area occurred, which still occurs, by the way, to this day. And uh, eBay just inflected, I saw it this morning, inflected strongly up off the support level, and that was a trade, at least an initial trade for short-term for, uh, short swing trading parameters. We'll see that shortly, but this is the same kind of concept. Horizontal slow, horizontal slow, and then breakout vertical fast trend, impulse, flags. And these are trading parameters within these. And again, one reason indicators don't work all the time is because market phases shift through these periods. Things that do well in ranges do not do well in trends and vice versa. By the way, individual traders with whom I work with and other colleagues tend to prefer one environment over the other. They typically don't do well in trends if they're good at ranges or good at trends if they're poor at ranges. So personally, I tend to be more of a trend trader myself. I think most people do better that way at least. So. Almost uh, to the conclusion, but this is how you trade. So theoretics is one thing, theoretics is fun, academics is entertaining, but let's actually figure out how to put this into practice with real trades. Targets, entries, stops. That's really what we're doing with any kind of strategy is a target, entry, stop. And then of course management. Psychology only serves for the most part to get in the way. Uh, especially if your last couple of trades were losing trades, you might not take this next one, so on and so forth. But that's why system trading or strategy trading or these types of methods tend to do what better, at least for eliminating discretion, at least eliminating uh, subjectivity and tending towards more objectivity, factual basis, as in the price is either at support or it's not. Price is either breaking out with higher volume or it's not. These are factual uh, bases with which to put trades on and of course stop losses. Generally in a consolidation pattern, we wish to play within the range. Playing into support, which for this purpose of this presentation, again, we'll focus mostly on the buy activities, just for most traders tend to prefer buys to short sells, if you're new to the trading environment. So that's your initial strategy is to buy into a support line and or if you're more aggressive or experienced, short sell into a resistance line. And of course, placing stops beyond the appropriate trend line because price could, and in fact, profile will tell us that, will actually in the future break free of this value area. It could be an earnings announcement, could be the CEO resigned, could be something else, whatever the case is. Perception of value will change and the stock will either break and trend higher in a new, in a new up auction or will actually break lower into a down auction. We don't cover that today, but we'll discuss down auctions and how they're quite different actually from up auctions. 
the, the general strategies, at least quick, quick, quick top level strategies for ranges. For trending vertical strategies, we typically wish to join into the supply demand imbalance, enter on breakouts of a trading range. Now, of course, there's traps. We need to find uh, strategies that help us differentiate as best as possible a trap versus a breakout. And we see that's multiply, or, uh, multiple times difficult, at least from subjective senses, especially if you're accustomed to trading in this fade or this range zone and the market breaks into a trend. That can be quite difficult. Uh, one thing we don't want to do, if we know this knowledge and have this phase kind of behavior, is remain in a losing trade, particularly a fade trade that can be very devastating and very unnecessary in terms of a loss if we're expecting a resistance level to hold or a support level to hold and yet the market impulse is higher. Let's go ahead and take that stop and uh, let's not let ego get in the way. So because we don't know the future. No one knows the future as a trader. It would be nice if we did, though. But we wish to enter on a breakout, hold as long as possible if the market's breaking to new highs. Very important. That's a very different environment. Uh, a breakout impulse of pro-trend new high, we would call this open air. Andrew talks about that a lot. Versus a similar breakout, which is what I'm showing here in Apple recently, to a prior value area. What I'm showing here is a subjective trend line when Andrew's indicator, especially the radar, shows actual value areas to target. I've been really interested in that. I'm really excited about that. It just shows a different way of conceptualizing market behavior and targeting and stops. So that's typically the course of action. When a market breaks a trend line or breaks free of this trading range, it typically will trade up into a prior value area. I think Andrew's said many times when in chart, to figure out the target, now look backwards to prior target areas. That's where participation was, value was accepted there, and more than not, that's where price is headed. So this is another sort of a zoomed in view of Apple, this is recently. So the initial break, this R stands for return, a return to trend line, a return to value. So initially break, oh, that's a trap, that's an initial break, so on. And in July, August, September, October, we have the breakout circled at 450 that returned to the prior area. A secondary breakout, secondary trade, we will call this a bull flag, but it's also a break free from a short-term value area that went right back into the pocket or the value area near 435. That's where Apple traded and actually traded down from. Trend lines are subjective. This is the exact same chart. Start with the left and move to the right. This is the setting up the trade chart. And also just reminding us one more time about fast vertical movement versus sideways horizontal range movement. Markets tend to oscillate between them. So if we're planning out the future, now we say we don't know the future, it's middle of 2013, Apple is in this trading range. Apple is forming value. This is yellow lines reflect price and volume nodes, or that's an indicator special to do that. And these blue zones represent areas where volume and price have actually not traded or traded very thinly. And that's areas that could propel breakouts, particularly away from a value area through a blue zone or blue radar toward a prior value area as indicated by the radar. And that's what happened. So it's the same chart that I showed in terms of a classical technical analysis or classical candle chart that Apple impulse from 440 all the way to this prior value area. And in fact, traded one more time to the upside to this uh, higher level. So that's in general, quick example. We can show many, many, many more examples of this, but not in the time frame with all that we're covering today. So in limitation, we'll turn back to Andrew shortly, but this is the summation of what we talked about. So what we need to know here, and this is just me being a trader for like 2003 is when I got involved in technical analysis and I've been through as many indicators, seminars, books, and, and, and so on and so forth. But these are concepts that I, when I work with traders as a, as a coach or just as talking with, even with Andrew, as colleagues, uh, we always simply come up with certain things that just really just uh, not annoy us, but bother us with charts. And one of those is, okay, okay, that's great. 
trend lines are clear if I look backwards in hindsight, but what happens now? What do I do? If something happens, then what next? I like to think of trading as if-thens. If price breaks free from, free from a value area, then where might it go? And of course, if I'm playing in a value area, if price is up at resistance or down at support, where do I place my stop? So that's, that's market movement. And that's talking about the future, planning out the future. Entries and stops and targets are based upon what's happening now. Now, which indicator do we use? I had this problem so many times, especially in my newer in my career. There's just too many. And you hear analysis paralysis or indicator paralysis. Very common with new traders and for intermediate traders as well. Uh, this chart of Google just shows popular indicators, stochastic, MACD, parabolic SAR, moving averages, Bollinger Bands, and it's just a jumbled mess, at least in the traditional sense. So just too many. So I have problems figuring out where the buy orders are, where the sells are, and oh, these stochastics have worked really well to buy, sell, buy, sell in a range, don't work well at all in a trend. These moving averages that work well for pullbacks and flags in a trend don't work at all, price chops up and down through them, in a trading range. So even if you get an indicator signal, even if you understand the indicator signal, it can be sometimes difficult to conceptualize the target and uh, where to place your stop. You need price itself. You really can't look at, oh, here's a Bollinger touch or whatever the indicator you're using is, SAR, et cetera, or a parabolic stop in reverse is what that color bar is. So it's difficult, at least in a general sense, with a single or combination of indicators to, to get trigger entries, which that's actually easy, but actually to get stops and targets. If there's a stochastic crossover, where does my stop go? And in fact, in a trending environment, the stochastic MACD RSI oscillators will become overbought and they'll stay overbought, uh, leading to significant losses if you just took that pure trade. And of course, even if you understand, and it's easy to get lots of educational examples, and there's plenty of education. I teach education, even if you understand it, uh, why should price move? What's the impetus? What's the reason? And if you conceptualize in terms of supply demand, buyer sellers, value, expansion, fast, slow, full, horizontal, vertical, all these concepts that Andrew talks about and these indicators help us to reveal in the charts. It helps you understand why. And just knowing logistics or theoretics or even some academic sense of why price moves helps us with confidence and might be the difference of putting on a trade or not. How many times have you seen a trade take place, seen a breakout or whatever the case is, not put that trade on and watched it go in your favor and you could have made 500, 1,000, whatever the dollar amount was, swing for intraday trade, but you didn't take the trade because you didn't feel right about it or, again, going back to the theme of emotion got in the way. But that's just a general sense. But again, thank, to, thank you to Andrew for having me on for this series and we'll actually turn back to him to talk more about these indicators, value areas, fast zones, radar, altimeter, and uh, thank you for attending, and I will be here to answer any questions. We'll turn back to Andrew. Hey, thanks, Corey. Appreciate that. You know, um, obviously, there's a lot to understand about, you know, the whole concept of, um, you know, just everything that we're talking about, right? So there, there's when do I get in, which has always been something that I have found that a lot of people are you know, confused about. Um, and uh, let me kind of uh, move my presenter over here, back to me here, and we will deal with that. Okay. Hopefully that's the right screen. Let's set myself up here for one second. Okay. Everybody can see that, hopefully. Um, basically, what the I, I think the uh, the biggest issue here is that markets are not always predictable. You know, and we know that. We know that individual stocks are not always predictable. And what happens is that when we are looking at when we want to get into something, the question is, okay, well, we may know that. But more of a question that I always ask is, well, what am I going to get into? What am I going to be looking at in terms of the, um, you know, the, the, the presentation of a stock? Now, a couple of things I'll, I'll share with you. Um, we have... A variety of webinars that are are coming up. 
Um, we have uh, totally different from what we're talking about here is a key reversal indicator. We're going to go over in depth and talk about that again. Hopefully, you've had the opportunity over at TradeStation to get your uh, your copy of the uh, trial at least. If nothing else, it's very inexpensive, and I would really strongly suggest that you utilize that because it gives a really good level of um, overall uh, a feel of the markets and in, in, in addition to that it also helps you with understanding where the trend is and how incredibly overdone or if it's you know continuing. Um, we're going to have another session and this is part two of the Traders Playbook which is coming on uh, in a uh, on the end the on the 15th and uh, if you haven't registered for that yet what you can do is you can go over to uh, the very simply over to triggercharts.com and let me kind of put that in here there wants to be one second if you haven't seen over in the chat I've been kind of chatting a few things over to you you can go over there and to the triggercharts.com slash events and sign up and that's a freebie so you'll be able to check that out um, the one that thing that I want to bring up to you that's very important is this, that you know what, if you're serious about making money, if you're really serious about bettering your trading, one of the ways that I've done it and uh, people that I know have done it is to very simply go over and you uh, will go over to someone who knows what they're doing, who has experience in the area, and basically you will find that they will help you through the process and even though it costs a few bucks in order to do so listen it's well worth it so you know I'm going to tell you that we have the advanced coursework uh, with Corey there's three group sessions beginning the 19th and I really want to see you there I think it's it's um, uh, very important somebody's mentioning there's no event on the 15th I'll take a look at that maybe it's this is the next webinar uh, it should be up there. If not, I'll get it up there. It should have been up there, but we'll make sure it's up there. Who was that? Will, um, and we'll we'll send you an email that everybody was that was attending here. Uh, but you could, you know, you, it, it may cost a little bit of money, but it makes sense. And one of the things that we're doing to make it a little bit easier for you is we're actually covering the cost of the Commander series for an entire month. So you're really only paying a few bucks if you think about it. Click that. I just put that through right now. Um, it is it is the uh, order form for it. It's really not that expensive if you think about the money that you may have lost or that you may have made or that you could have made inside of one trade. And I got to tell you something. If, again, it's $199 for three sessions, which again includes one month free subscription to the Commander Series. So you're not really paying that much if you think about it, okay? Um, the second thing is that you can do per session, although you know you can only get part of it and if you want to know really the details and see the live actual work of that you need to be involved in a situation where you can find a repetitive way of really understanding what's happening when to get in etc and I will even by the way give you a uh, um, a, a special uh, radar screen inside a trade station that will allow you to search and get alerts on the breakout potential on the stocks that you're looking for so you don't have to worry about the charts okay um, yeah William uh, we will on the uh, the three sessions the conflict in the sessions that that's a problem yeah we'll have other ones in the future um, you know I'd rather you do it live William that is important um, but we can talk about that send me an email on that okay but but seriously and, and I'm not just trying to pitch this the bottom line is that if you really want to seriously get involved in trading and doing the, the indicators that we have have been very well worked through there is reasons why we'll use those versus some of the ones that you get on freebies the whole point is that you want to ride the coattails of the um, of the professionals and where are the professionals and where on the institutions buying and selling that's all involved in how this was made up it's all about the supply demand they talked about it's all the, it's all about when you're going to um, be involved at what point and where it is on the chart and you know what the markets could be in a downtrend and you may find something that is breaking out onto the top end or vice versa so you know think about this for a second you know to, to get and I'm, I'm serious about this I really am I want you to listen to this to get three 90 minute sessions for 199 bucks okay and a one month free to the full suite of the commander series 
I mean, that's pretty good. We're going to try, you know, the bottom line, we're trying to get you hooked on this, okay? That's what we want to do. We want to get you hooked on this. So, um, you know, do that and make sure to click there. And I just put that link in there. I think uh, that was in there somewhere. So just look at the, um, the, the messages right there. And we're going to go through a very detailed discussion of all of this inside of there, okay? Let me go back to this for one second and end this up. There's also one-on-one -on -one coaching. Now, this is something, if you really want to get some power and you want to understand your particular circumstance and how you trade and get an analysis of that, and then you want to further your trading, now we're talking a little bit different. Now we're talking about one-on-one -on -one coaching and analysis and uh, recommendation in terms of what you should be looking for and really how to use things in in-depth look at what's happening so that you will be able to scan a chart like I do. You just scan a chart and you can kind of see what's happening. Now, it may or may not do what you want it to do. It may not actually become a, a profitable trade, but you know what? You can work on limiting losses or maybe even uh, looking for other things that aren't um, particularly what you're looking at because so many people get caught up in one particular stock or one particular trade. So um, we're going to turn over to Corey for a second. Um, the other thing that I want to mention here, this is really important. This is, this is, I want you to pay attention right now. This is really important. That you can actually have the education and you can have the uh, indicators paid for by TradeStation. We have a pretty good amount of money per person. Now all you have to do is basically have a new account to open with them. So if you have a current account, you can open up a new one, and we put a special credit on there if you are involved in these courses or have the indicators. And what you get is up to a $3,000 rebate on all your transaction costs, and it, up to the point of uh, where you're going to get um, $3,000. And we can actually increase that up to $5,000. So if you are interested in the private lessons, you know, the one on ones, think about that for a second. You can get a bunch of those and have TradeStation essentially give you a rebate program to get that paid for. And then also, if you have any trouble with installing, sometimes there's a little ins installation issue. How do I actually get this stuff? We have some uh, ways of doing this. Just put a contact us, to, you know, send it to us, and we'll help you along with that. It's pretty easy to do, um, but we'll get that for you. Uh, let's take a couple quick questions. Uh, Corey, are you still with us? Hello, Corey. I am here. Sorry. Okay, good. Any questions? Why don't you... I am here. Okay, just type in some questions. We have about five minutes left for some questions, or a few minutes left for some questions. I got a few that I answered already on the side, um, but you just set it into the question area uh, in the chat, and we will uh, give you uh, our best ability to answer them. So anything you want. Hello. Everybody's busy probably signing up. I've got a lot of people probably signing up for that course, to be honest with you. Um, the uh, the other thing I want to mention just real quickly, and um, I did get a lot of questions I answered on the side, so maybe that was the what happened there. Um, but, you know, we will be available, and on the 15th, I believe it is, and if it's not in the, uh, in the, in the events area right now, we will, in fact, get that for you. Uh, we will give you uh, an email about that. Uh, yeah, that's a good. That's a good question, Edgar. Edgar asked a question about how directly do the concepts translate to leveraging ETFs such as uh, uh, Nugget and Dust. Those are the uh, triple ETFs on the uh, gold miners. And let me let me tell you the answer to that. It's very simple. Personally, I would not use the those particular uh, uh, you know those particular um, uh, stocks or symbols. I would use the core and find out where those breakdown points are, because the triples can be a little bit weird and wonky. Uh, and, but I would use the core ones, because you can get a better volume read on it. So use like GDX, for example. And um, you know you can use that, and then they translate perfectly, OK? Yeah, ex yep, at GDX, exactly. Why do you not have an oscillator? Um, we actually are working on an oscillator that we have. We have an oscillator we've built over time. Um, and as a matter of fact, it's a fantastic oscillator. It, it, it combines. Um, some of the ones that you probably used to, at least in theory, and we put a lot more into it to make it kind of like a, a super-powered oscillator, where you have a uh, the ability to, um, you know, all in one, and we call it the T-score, the technical score, that will give you a, a readout of the score, and that's coming very soon. Um, okay, so so here's a question: um, How do you create a volume profile for FX or or um, um, Forex. So here's the thing: there is no volume 
on Forex. So you don't get any readings on Forex. So what we do is we use that what's called um, uh, price at time. You find out where the pricing has been at any given time and how long it's been sitting there, and then we use that as a calculation methodology to then look at and build profiles. And it works very well. As a matter of fact, one of the one of the best used um, uh, portions of the radar or the altimeter is a 240 minute on the FX or on Forex. So you can use that quite often. Now, what you could also do is instead of using it on Forex directly, you could use it on the futures of Forex. And by the way, I've mentioned this before. I'm just going to tell you, at use the app, the ampersand sign there, um, or the at, not the ampersand, the at sign above the two. Uh, for example, JY. That would be for the futures on the Jap Japanese yen. Oh, never, 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 never use the core indicator uh, for individual futures that are the current. You always have to use the generic indicators. Okay, it's very, very uh, important. So. It's tick, not volume. In terms of Forex, yeah, there's no volume on Forex. You don't get any volume. There's no such thing. They, they don't pass that through. So, yes, you're using basic pricing uh, on it, and it's, it's moment by moment. It builds. Whether you're using a daily or a weekly or a 60-minute, every single tick, whether it's a Forex or whether it's a future, whether it's a stock, every single tick builds the profile. I think we're going to end it there, and I do hope that uh, you have uh, signed up for either the next event or made sure, because we're not going to have a, a lot of people available to be in the group sessions, just to let you know, we're going to have a, um, a, a, uh, a yeah, thank you, yeah, what is that, uh, we are not going to have a, um, thank you, uh, we're not going to have a lot of people available for that, so, you know, we, once we get to a certain point, we're going to cut it off, so if you do want to um, uh, participate in that, you can. Anyway, thanks for, for uh, joining us, and uh, do me a favor, um, send us any information that you uh, have questions on, best is email, and um, Edgar, uh, or whoever was asking about the phone numbers and all that, that's all available to the site. Just, just Edgar, send me an email. We'll, we'll, we'll figure out a time to get together on that, okay? All right, thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you real soon.